seeing an orca and meeting a lot of you guys is a great time. Yeah. So I thought today I would talk a little bit about the Solomon Islands because it's one of the things that's probably not understood by a lot of people and um, there's so much attention on Taiji. And um, the Solomon Islands is actually the largest dolphin slaughter in the world when it comes to the drive slaughter. I think there are more dolphins possibly killed in Peru, but that is using harpoon hunting. This is a traditional drive hunt, like you see in the movie The Cove, where a wall of sound is created and the dolphins are driven in. And so to give a little uh, reference, I'm just returning from the Solomons. I've been there now three times in the past 12 months. And we actually have a team that's on the ground now permanently in the village of Fanale, which is the dolphin hunting village in the Sol Solomon Islands. And from the map, you can see the Solomons is just next to Papua New Guinea. It's one of the last very like tribal places in the world. They do have a formal government, but outside of the main city, it's all completely tribal. Um, this would actually be the Solomons. And the area that all the dolphin hunting is, is Malaika. And this is where family would be right down here. And there's a few villages up in here that hunted, but not like family. This is the one that's killing about 750 dolphins a year average. Um, you, saw, you saw blood dolphins to show that. You know, we went to a village up here called Patama. But Patama actually hasn't hunted dolphins in about 30 years. Um, they only started catching dolphins again when Chris Porter came to the Solomons and started offering money for dolphins for export. And so they started getting back into the dolphin game, but they pretty much had given it up. So all the hunting is pretty much located now in Fanale. And this will give you a better view of Fanale. Yeah, this is Fanale Island here, and the village is down on the bottom. So the village is actually here, right here. And the rest of the island is all mangrove and completely flooded. And in fact, the whole village flooded except for a little strip of pathway in between the houses, and the houses are all on stilts. And this would be the area where they drive the dolphins in. They had on one-man canoes, sometimes 20 miles out to sea. And they drive the dolphins through this passage, banging on these special rocks that are a flint from a special beach that they have. And they drive the dolphins up into these mangroves, where they're caught and put into the canoes, and then brought back to this beach right here where they're slaughtered. And um, these people are known as the saltwater people. They live a predominantly life on the sea. They're, you can't grow anything here. You know, there's small pots of plants in them, but there's no real produce produced here. It's all up in the bush. So Fanale will take the dolphin meat and go to the villages into the bush and trade with the local merchants for potatoes or for rice and go back and forth. There's really no currency or money in this area. Whatsoever. Let's see if I can do a little hand here. This is the whole. And so even though you're seeing little dots of houses, these are just huts. There's no electricity here. There's just cell phone service in the past two years, finally, barely. There's no running water. This is just completely isolated. And there's probably that's why there's not a lot known about this hunt, because it's not something you can just hop on a boat and go see. This is what one of the traditional homes look like. And they're all up on stilts because these guys are on the forefront of climate change. These are some of the first climate change um, refugees in the world. And their island is literally only a foot above sea level. And so as the oceans are changing, they're going underwater. And literally, I was there on the spring tide, and you would walk out down those stairs, and you're waist deep in water walking to the neighbor's house. But because they've been on this island for so long, they don't own any land anywhere else. So it's a real conundrum for them because what do they do? Like they don't, they can't just move across to the other side. That's another tribe's land. And so um, I'm going to show you some more pictures here of one of the neighboring villages. This is, this is Fanley Village. You can see the water coming up in the middle of the village. They've been hunting dolphins in Fanley for, it's all oral tradition, but it seems to be about 500 to 700 years, which would obviously predate Japan. From what I've learned, and me visiting both places, I would guess that some soldier after World War II saw this going on and took this information back to Japan and taught them how to do it because the, the hunt in Japan started essentially in the 50s with the advent of the outboard engine. 
these guys have been using the same technique with the driving the stones for 500 to 700 years. So it is ingrained in their culture. And, and neighboring villages do the same thing with bats and dogs, because in, this, in these kind of islands, there isn't um, resources like gold and silver and things, so they can't make money. So their money was seashells and teeth and things like that. That's what they use. Here's a good uh, flyover of the village where you can actually see the flooding. Is, what's the, I'm going to go back to that one. Um, there we go. These are some of the locals. These are, uh, and Solomon Islands for the most part are Malaitans, which are kind of closely re related to the Aborigines. And so you'll see a lot of these kids with just blonde hair and blue eyes. Whereas the rest of the Solomons would be more uh, Polynesian. And this was just literally, I walked on the beach for five minutes, and there's a dolphin jawbone at the top, there's a vertebrae, there's a turtle jaw. These were actually part of a giant squid. But this is the kind of stuff you find everywhere. I mean, these people live off the sea. When, when they see a pod of dolphins swimming by, for them it's, it's lunch. And they don't, they don't understand that these are mammals. That to them it's just like a snapper or a grouper or a tuna. So we're working, we're hopefully we're working with James that. Um, this would be a, well, one of the local villagers in a canoe. And so every, because they're on this island, there also is no fresh water. Every day they're having to paddle a couple miles up into the mangroves to a fresh water source, fill up these buckets, and come back to the house. And this is a daily routine. Here's one of the dolphin hunters and one of his canoes. And so they go in these canoes literally 10, 15 miles out in the open ocean. And what they'll do is they'll spread out one canoe every about half mile. And inside the canoes, they have small flags. So when one of them will see a dolphin, they'll raise the flag. And the way they move the flag around is indicating which way the pod is moving. And then the next canoe, a half a mile away, he can see the flag. And they all will start to orient themselves into that horseshoe shape that you see in Japan. And it's pretty amazing that they can actually do this and drive with canoes and just rocks a dolphin in 20 miles. But they were able to do it. And they're the only tribe. If you go to the bush, even just across the way in that, in that one shot I showed you, those villages, even though they live on the coastline, are petrified of the ocean. None of them jump in the ocean. They have a completely different style of even paddling. They're known as the bush people, and these are the saltwater people. And so only the saltwater people would dare venture out past the mainland out into open sea. Here's some, oops, let me get back to that one. Here's some, these are the guys with the flags. Raising, they've driven and some dolphins in there, driving them towards the mangroves. This kind of illustrates how they form the U-shape and get into a smaller, and then this would be the passage that they would drive the dolphins into, into this passage up into these mangroves. Once they get them in the mangroves, they're able easily, especially the spinner dolphins, the spinner dolphins pretty much just give up instantly. And they're able just literally to pick them up and throw them into the canoes and then they'll take them back to the beach where they'll, they'll do the actual slaughter. And I didn't include any of the slaughter pictures because it is quite brutal. This was another dolphin hunting island. This was called Walende. And at one point, this is actually a man-made island made by guys in canoes dumping rocks onto a reef over 100 years and building it up enough. At one point, there were over 100 houses on this little patch. And about five years ago, the village packed up and moved across the way, and there's one guy left with one house. <laughs> You'll see the village in a second. That entire village at one point was living on this man-made island. And um, these guys did hunt dolphins. They stopped about 20 years ago, and it's actually due to climate change. It's gotten so shallow in here, they no longer can drive dolphins in. So they've actually given it up. Although a few of the guys will pay sometimes to join the hunt from Fanale. I brought my drone, I was having tons of fun there with <laughs> flying the drone. You can really get a good scale of how dense and what kind of jungle this is as you come in. So this entire village at one point was living on this little island. They're having a huge population explosion there as well. As of everywhere. So the ones that live in the bush, they, they're lucky enough because they have been up, up in here. These are all gardens. 
so they're able to garden and they're able to sustain themselves. The guys that live on Fanale, they're really, they depend on the sea. It's every day waking up and going and fishing for whatever, turtles, tuna. Um, so when they get the dolphins, this is actually, I happen to be there during a bride price ceremony. The teeth are used for different purposes. One of the main purposes is during a wedding ceremony. This would be the bride would be in the middle. And typically the parents of the bride, the family are given between 1,000 and 3,000 dolphin teeth for a wedding ceremony. And then also underneath that, you'll see some red necklaces. Those are shell money. So there'll be maybe like 10 lengths of shell money, 1,000 dolphin teeth, five bags of potatoes, and 10 pounds of rice. And that will be what will be handed over for the wedding. Here's another one with some of the other, the dowry. You can see some of the shell money. And other tribes use fox teeth. They use bat teeth for getting married or dog's teeth. This one, they just happen to be dolphins. Um, it's become a decorative thing as well that not only during weddings, but just people like to rock their dolphin teeth all the time sometimes. These are mostly spinner dolphins. That's what they pretty much get the most of the time. They had about six species they were hunting. They're down to two now that they get. The one that's the most prized, the ulubulu, is the big teeth, and we believe it's a melon-headed whale, but it's been over 100 years since they've gotten a melon-headed whale. So even they have some understanding that the species are depleting. This one, I think those are bottlenose teeth. So then what, the teeth all get distributed, let me stop this real quick. It's kind of interesting, the teeth, when they catch them, they do it on a prize system the way they distribute the teeth. And so 10% of the teeth right off the top go to the Anglican church, which is a small little church on the island. Then the remaining majority of the teeth go to the first prize, which would be the actual dolphin hunters that went out and caught the dolphins. Second prize would be all the women and children and people that came down to the beach to help kill the dolphins. And then third prize would go to the elderly or people that are not married or just anyone related to anyone on the island. And that way everyone kind of shares in the bounty. And so for them, it's, you know, the teeth are representing their, when they're getting married, it's representing meat that they can take, this is a local market. And vendors just set up and there's no money here, it's all just trade. So the dolphin meat there is highly prized because there's no cows or there's just a few pigs. So meat is something that's, that's really highly valued. So it's, it's a real challenge because it, it, dolphin hunting represents so many things to these people. It's also, there's about 100 families that live in Fanale, and not necessarily everybody gets along all the time, just because they're all related. And so it's the one day where everyone has to work together. If they don't work together, they can't hunt dolphins. And so um, the past two years, they average about 750 a year. Last year, there were only 90 dolphins killed. This year, there were only 30. And that's purely because there's division right now in the village, partly because of me, that a lot of the villagers are citing and don't want to hunt dolphins anymore, but also there's, there's also internal family squabbles that happen there that families just start fighting and they won't talk to each other. And so there's a little bit of all of that happening right now. But it goes to show that they don't have to have dolphins. Like they only got 30 dolphins this year. No one went hungry, everyone survived. People got married, life went on. And so we're hoping to continue that and see if there. This is one of this, he's like the village elder, Stanley Fillet. And this is Sarah Meltzer, she works at the Dolphin Project, and she is an um, anthropologist who did her doctoral dissertation in 1973 on Fanale Village. She lived there alone as a 22-year-old 22 22 -year girl and lived there for about three years and has now made about two dozen trips back to Fanale, but she is, um, she's dynamite and she shot some phenomenal eight millimeter footage in 1973 of the village, of village life. And last time we actually took the video, put a projector on the beach and showed the video of themselves. They don't even have TV there or cameras or anything. And they got to see a video of themselves from 1973. And they got to see their grandparents walk. I think I have some of the video. Actually, this is it. So anyone that's an, an adult in this is not alive because the immediate age there is about 60. Nobody makes it really past that. And it's interesting, like, village life has not changed much, basically, in 
40 years, it's, they're living the same. So we're working right now to turn this into a film, some of the old footage and some of the newer footage. So um, this is called a tohi, this building. This is actually the dolphin prayer house. Before there's a dolphin hunt, the men come in here and they recite a special prayer, but it's also where the community holds meetings. And this is uh, Dr. Meltzoff holding one of our many meetings that we have with the community. So for the past year and a half, they know why I'm there, because I came in 2011 with blood dolphins, and they knew I was there at that, that time as a filmmaker, but they knew what I was trying to achieve. And so for the past year and a half, I've been traveling there a lot, and all we've been doing is just kind of asking them, it's a different approach, instead of like, most NGOs in the Solomons work top down. We're completely grassroots, we're working from the bottom up, so it's not like I'm coming up with all these ideas for projects, and we're like proposing them to them. We literally sat for a year and a half listening to them. What is it you actually need here? Because in the Solomons, there's a million NGOs, and there's a lot of these white elephant projects where an NGO will build a big building and it just sits empty and there's chickens running around it the next week. I don't want to see that happen. So we've been carefully weeding out all the ideas that they would be willing to sign an MOU to end the Dolphin Hunt. What would they want? And so we've been working with the women's groups. We've got the women organized and they're really kind of the motor of the whole village. Um, although the men think they run the show, the women <laughs> run the show. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the virtual reality piece I did with the dolphins. I brought the goggles if anyone wants to try it here, but um, <laughs> they've all been trying the virtual reality. <laughs> How did they react to that? They were blown away. And it was funny because I had a bunch of videos that I brought, and one of them had One Direction on it, and a bunch of people, they all knew One Direction. I'm like, how do you know? <laughs> There's no radio stations, there's no newspaper, there's no TV. So for the past few years that I've been going, I always noticed one of the things on the list is this building, and this was the kindergarten, but it's nothing. It's, it's this thatched house that they built about two years ago. And they, the village built it hoping that if they built it, the government would kick in and start paying teachers, because they don't have a school there. So it's been sitting there for two years, so on my last trip, as a sign of good faith, the Dolphin Project has sponsored the kindergarten. We built a new one. It'll be done next week, and school starts next week, and we're putting 65 kids. <laughs> These are some of the teachers that'll be working there, and we're using the normal Solomon Island curriculum, but we're also, we have a grad student there that uh, has her master's degree in environmental education, and we're creating a special curriculum about the environment and sustainability. And it's, it's tailored to their exact environment of everything that lives in their passage that they're seeing and understanding how everything's interconnected. We're also working to help come up, not everyone's gonna love every idea there, like we, we're gonna start introducing beekeeping and there's already like four or five guys that are there interested in it, but these are saltwater people, so I don't expect everyone there to jump on the beekeeping bandwagon. So we're, we're coming up, we literally have a list of 50 different projects that somehow would represent everyone from building a music school there to sponsoring the sports teams to um, uh, we're doing uh, seaweed farming. Um, we've proposed to build a clinic for them. It'll be wind and solar powered. And so I think on its own because of climate change that this hunt probably would end in the next 20 years. But I've kind of fallen in love with this village, and it's, it, if it happened, they're going to be displaced. And it's going to be an end of their culture as they, they know it. And so I want to try to do something that hasn't been done in the Solomons and create something really special there where we're going to create marine protected zones. And we're teaching the fishermen basically, let's fish in this one zone three months out of the year, and then we're going to shift and fish, fish in this zone. And learning how to work with their environment so that in the event there's a bigger population explosion, the, the passage they live in will be able to handle it. Because right now there's like three or four guys, for instance, that are net fishing and putting that fish on a boat, sending it to the main city. Well, this little village can't support feeding the main city, it can barely support feeding the people in the passage. So we're trying to work with them to create a sustainable way for them to be able to stay and prolong village life. Because 
It's funny, when I first went, I, I watched Blood Dolphins the other day and I made a quote in it where I was, first time I walked in one of the villages, I was saying how they absolutely had nothing and how poor they are, but it's actually the opposite. When you live in the village, you're rich. You don't need money. Your kids just can run around crazy. Like, if you want a banana, you grab it from the tree. If you want some beetle nut, you grab it from a tree. It's only when those guys go to the city that they become poor people, because as soon as they hit the city, they're part of society, and it costs money every time you move in a taxi or do anything. And so I'm trying to, as much as I can, preserve their culture and preserve their village life and hold that together. Because they, they don't believe they have it all. Um, it's one of the most beautiful places. And so they're very open to all of this. It's not like, um, you know, there's a few guys that say we'll never stop hunting dolphins, but the reality is it takes 40 to 50 guys to do it. And at this point, they don't really have the numbers anymore, and it's just heading more in that direction away from that. So we're also opening in the next year, we're going to open up a, have a homestay there that people can come and stay for a week, and that money will go right back into this project to help pay for the teachers and help pay for all the projects that we're doing and bringing there. And so hopefully in the next year, we can get some sort of you guys to come visit and see what a, you know, a traditional dolphin hunt used to look like that. Like, you know, it'd be created for you without actually harming the dolphins. And um, yeah, it's exciting because this is actually the largest slaughter of dolphins in the world. It would embarrass the hell out of Japan if this village could pull together and stop. This, this is culture, this is tradition. What happens in Japan is not cultural or traditional. It's been going on for 50 years. And so I think it's going to be a huge statement if these guys actually will pull together and stop. And so we're hoping in the next two or three years that we're going to see the complete end of dolphin hunting in the Solomon Islands. Um, he just wants to know more, more about it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot to be about that. Um, if you look for it, I've read some stories, but I'm just trying to elaborate what Mark Simmons and Ocean Embassy... Ocean Embassy is the enemy. They are enemy number one when it comes to dolphins. Um, they sound like this really kind of green thing, but they're a bunch of ex World guys that, or people that are the dolphin dealers. They're the ones that are setting up the big deals. They, they sold all the dolphins to Dubai to the, uh, the 30 or so that went to the Philippines, and they're based in Orlando. They were heavily involved in, uh, what was the, uh, what's the, uh, I hate that, the dolphin movie? Um, the dolphin in Florida? Oh, Winton. Yeah, they were heavily involved in that second movie, and a bunch of them, I think Mark, Robin Friday, yeah, he's in, they're all, they have cameos in the movie if you really look carefully. But they basically were the guys, they were the ones, Ocean ABC, that set up the deals and set up the transport of dolphins. Chris Porter was just, he was kind of like a lone wolf that was in the Solomons. He was the one that organized the actual hunting of the dolphins. He didn't have anything to do with the actual deal itself and the shipping. Um, yeah, like I showed, I said in Batama, Batama hadn't hunted dolphins since the 80s. And then they heard there was this American guy, or Canadian guy, he's paying big dollars for dolphins. So all these villages just started catching dolphins, penning them up, waiting for Chris Porter to come back to tell them, like, are these the right dolphins? And almost every single time they caught the wrong dolphins and would hold them for sometimes two to three months waiting for Chris Porter. The whole village is feeding them cans of tuna fish. Um, he created a real mess because there was, you know, these 30 years of not hunting dolphins is a generation. They had forgotten about it. And now it's like back on the tip of their, you know, tongue and one. So it's a tricky country and we're moving very carefully there because I also don't want to see other villages start to say they're hunting dolphins so they can get benefits from the dolphin project. And so we're moving very carefully and slowly. Mm -hmm. Since Ocean Embassy There is, but that's a different NGO. Yeah. I, I, I try to save dolphins. And I, this is even outside of my box. Like I've never built a school before, but I can figure out how to make it happen. But um, those are like, yeah, much I mean, larger. Do you guys partner with anybody? Or you're just we haven't yet. At this point, just trying to yeah. become a part of it. So many of the NGOs that are in the Solomons are religious based. And so I've been kind of shedding away from them yeah. because the missionaries basically run the Solomons. And so I'm um, trying to go a different route. 
So do you speak the language and do you live there permanently? I speak, um, they speak a common, like there's just in the one island alone, there's over 70 dialects. But they all speak a common, what's called pidgin, which is kind of like Jamaican or like in Bahamas. And so I'm able to speak pidgin, so we're able, and a lot of them can read the Bible, so they're able to read or understand the native English, so we're able to communicate. And you live there? No, I go, I just go all the time. Okay. I go every like two months, probably. It's a hard trip, though. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a day and a half to get there, and then once you get there, you gotta get on a 24-hour ferry from hell to get out to the actual <laughs> island. There's, you know, massive earthquakes all the time and things that shut down transportation. <laughs> There's almost no airports open in all of the Solomon Islands because of tribal disputes. You know, the runway's running through some tribe's land and they won't go throw the spears at the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally like, there is zero infrastructure. Only five years ago, they were issuing something like six new SIM cards a day to the whole country in the Solomon. And if you made a phone call more than two minutes, it would hang up the phone so other people could make phone calls. But they have a real chance. It's more beautiful than Fiji, than Hawaii, than any of these islands. It's one of the biggest battles of World War II. The Battle of Guadalcanal was fought in the Solomon. So you can literally swim off the beach, and there are airplanes and tanks and jeeps. You can go into the bush, and you can find guns on the ground. I mean, it, it's, that, it's like the war stopped, and just everyone walked away and left everything laying there. It's the most spectacular diving I've ever done in my life. Yet there's, I think, less than 10,000 people a year visit the Solomon. And probably this is part of the problem is dolphin hunting. They do have a little bit of malaria there, which keeps the tourists away. And there's some ethnic fighting. Also, it gets a little tricky sometimes. Like the guys must be crazy. Jump and drive. Men, men only. Would it be possible for them to drive in enough? Well, right now, currently in the Solomons, it's illegal to export, but we've put a stop to that. And so the hope is eventually to get the government to enact a law where they put a moratorium on the slaughter of dolphins, but that won't happen until the village agrees to do it first, and then the government will fall behind. But it, it's actually, it's, it's a male-dominated thing, the dolphin hunt. Women aren't actually not even allowed to watch the men as they paddle off to the hunt. Um, only until the dolphins are brought inside the passage, then the women and children are allowed to take part. The dolphins they got this year, actually this year and last year, there was no successful hunts. This year they got 30 dolphins, but that literally they would wake up and see dolphins right off of the beach. They'd jump in their canoes and paddle them in 30 feet. A well, hunt is when they go out 20 miles and they're out all day and they're looking for dolphins. And it's been three years now since they've successfully hunted any dolphins. So it's a good sign. Ten percent off the top. Off the top. Mm -hmm. So when they decide that you're someone to give a gift to, what are they going to give you? What do you need to give a gift to? They're not going to give you the dolphin teeth, right? No. Well, the dolphin teeth just—they don't give them as gifts. Dolphin teeth is like—it's like money. Oh, so it's like a tithe. Yeah. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, so, so let's say they get a thousand dolphin teeth. They kill all these dolphins. They get a thousand teeth. The way they split them up is ten percent. A hundred would go to the, 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 the church, and then the. 70% would go to the first tier, which is the actual 40 men in the canoes. The second tier would be the people that helped on the beach. Right, right. And they each get their little handful of teeth. Oh, I think I get all that. I was just curious to know what they would give you as a sign of appreciation. Oh, I've been given teeth, at all sorts of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not teeth, They've given me teeth. Oh, yeah. Well, you did. It's their thing. I mean, it's like even there's, there's one guy that even pulled it together where he's got like a little store on the village. And he doesn't make any money because he's related to everyone and it's all credit. And if somebody in your family's hungry and they need something from the store, you can't say no. But he actually will exchange goods for dolphin teeth. And he takes them on a one tooth for one Solomon dollar. But then he takes the teeth that he collects from them, sends it to the ferry to his sister in the city. She's able to get $3 a tooth. So not only is he making money in the store on things, but then he's actually taking the money that they're giving him and he's making three times the money on that. But he has a, a daughter that is kindergarten age, so he's super excited for this school, so he's for the project. He doesn't care if he loses the store and the dolphin. That's great. Yeah. Great. And so how are you collaborating with the church for I'm not. 
I mean, it's like the, the church there is not like directly connected with the Anglican Church, like in London. No. If I asked London like about, they would have no have no idea what I'm even talking about. This is a little hut with a little cross, and it's got a diving tank for a bell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but still, it seem to be at the top of the. Um, yeah. The all religions at the top. So you seem like you'd have to collaborate some of them. They could be against. You. Yeah. No, the church is full for us because. We're helping the community with other projects that, that they're interested in, the church is interested in. That's great. Any other questions? I can even do anything about, I have a that it doesn't have to be solved. Uh, the slaughter method, is, has Japan copied that, or is it just a... It's pretty much a copy of the Japan, um, with Japan they're using well, like a spike for the skull, and Solomon's they actually just use a machete and they just cut the head right off, or they try to. And there was actually, I think a few years ago, there was a, about five years ago when Earth Island did their MOU. That's another thing that we're, we're trying to overcome is that Earth Island basically just offered them $300,000 cash to a village that's never doesn't even have currency. And that was a disaster waiting to happen. And so they're very apprehensive of working with any NGOs because of that experience. Um, which has made things challenging because they just want money because there's no money there and everyone's like, well, can you buy us a boat? Can you buy us a hotel that we could run and we can make money? But um, basically all the projects that I'm proposing are things that will, are not involving cash, I'm staying away from cash. Except for like beekeeping where we can sell the honey and I've already explained to them like four beehives in one month will pay the salary of two teachers. And I'm like, if we think of it as a community and the community owns these four beehives, the community is now taking over and paying these teachers, and they, you don't have to worry about the government, just do it yourselves. So it's just on that kind of understanding that we're getting through with them. Hey, Lincoln, thank you so much for being here. All no right. Love the work you are doing and you guys are doing. Um, explain a little bit, maybe everyone else understands this, but maybe just explain it to me, since I don't quite get it. The Dalton trade, you mentioned something about Dubai, uh, the Dalton traders that are still going there. Is that well, no. It, you know, what we were finding out when I did blood dolphins, that was kind of my interest, was that it seemed like the country that would allow the slaughter of the dolphins would also allow the export. And so that's what happened with the Solomons. Chris Porter realized, like, oh, these, they'll allow them to kill them. They'll probably let us catch a few and sell them. And so the exporters set up there. There was, at one point, I think three different groups at the same time all trying to export out of the Solomons. And they would pay the fishermen $5 for a dolphin that they're selling for $130,000. Um, it's all ended now. There is no, as of right now, the current government, which changes every four years, but currently it's illegal to export dolphins. All the dealers have been run out of there. Chris Porter's Island has been completely demolished and taken back to a natural island. And um, I'm hearing reports actually this week, there's one last dolphin in captivity in the Solomons, and it's a guy that has, if you saw blood dolphins, I showed a guy that in his backyard had a swimming pool and he had like a 12 dolphins in this like this green, disgusting green tank. They've all died. There was one left when I was there a month ago, and I just saw reports on the internet that he let the last one go, which I think it probably died, but he let that one go. So there, there are no more, luckily, in captivity there. And much to the credit of you guys. Hopefully, we'll see. The problem there is that it's third world, and that the government changes every four years, so you just gotta stay on it. And, but um, they're just really dying for tourism, so they're trying to do anything to clean up their image of it in Solomon. So they're really kind of open to all these ideas. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs>